Recently, at Rose's Restaurant of Angola, New Jersey, took place a dinner and presentation organized by the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization, APO. The event, titled Estate Planning and Protection Strategies, was presented by Ani Hovanesian, Esquire. Ani Hovanesian is a wealth planning attorney in Holland in Knights' New York office and a member of the firm's private wealth services group. She concentrates her private client practice on wealth planning, tax planning, and business succession planning. In 2017, Ms. Hovanesian was chosen as a Holland Knight Rising Star, the firm's leadership and business development program for a few select women attorneys. Using PowerPoint slideshow presentation, Hovanesian spoke about several components of family estate planning and protection strategies, including the importance of proper asset planning for both married and single individuals, she explained the basic standalone will. I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with a will. There are two strategies when clients come to me that we approach estate planning. One can be with what's called a standalone will. In the alternative, there's something called a pour over will in conjunction with a revocable trust. When we talk about a standalone will, we're talking about that document that's going to direct what happens with your probate property at death. It's important that you just have a very brief understanding of what probate property is. Don't get confused by the word. All it is is anything that you own that is in your soul name. So if you have a house that's in your soul name, not joint with your spouse, if you have a um, bank account, brokerage account, your medical practice, anything that's in your name, your soul name, is probate property and is controlled by the terms of your will. In the alternative, for those that are married and other individuals who may have joint property with right of survivorship or joint property husband and wife, these assets are non-probate property. What does that mean? That means they are not governed by the terms of your will. So despite what your will may say, leave everything to my spouse, you may have a joint account with your mother or your grandmother and that, the, and by virtue of law, the fact that it's a joint account, that the survivor will, will receive those assets at death. She then spoke about revocable living trust and pour over will. A revocable living trust, what is that? During your lifetime, you form a trust. That trust is fully amendable and you can completely revoke it. You take your probate property, so those assets that are in your sole name, you retitle the legal ownership of, those, of that property in the name of this revocable trust. You are the sole trustee of that revocable trust. You are the sole beneficiary of that revocable trust. It is living, breathing during your life. And you have full right to control all the assets in it. Nothing changes. You're still signing your bank account. If it was in your own name and now it's in a revocable trust, for your own benefit, you're still signing as the trustee, you're still controlling, you're still living in your house. Nothing changes in that respect. But the benefit is that when you become incapacitated or when you die, automatically by the terms of that trust, your successor trustee has the legal right to continue managing and administering those assets without any court intervention. It's legal. Once we've set up this trust, we need to do one thing, which is we have to act in conjunction to the trust. We do what's called a pour-over will. A pour-over will is very um, indicative of its name. What, it, what the pour-over will does is to the degree that you may forget or you may not be able to, to during your life to transfer the asset, the ownership of an asset during your life in the name of the revocable trust, and there are certain probate assets that you may pass away with at death, the pour over will simply says, please take any probate assets that I have at death and transfer them to the revocable trust so the trustee can administer the terms of the trust according to my wishes. We have Robin Williams here. He's laughing. As we know, many years, a few years ago, Robin Williams passed away. And the reason because he's smiling is because he knows the advantages of having a revocable trust with a pour over will. Why is he smiling? Because his family avoided probate because not that he was ever incapacitated, but again, if you become incapacitated, which happens, and many people come running to me and say, you know, we don't have the proper documents, we need to submit guardianship papers in, in uh, submission for court. Again, we're talking about delays, we're talking about problems, and we're talking about fights. 
She also discussed the benefits of marital trust for spouse as well as will for children and children trusts for life. We're talking about husband, wife, they have children. When one of the spouses pass away, should I distribute outright to my spouse? Should I distribute in trust? Many people say, I want it simple, Ani. Please, let's just, I'll just have everything go outright to my spouse and, um, you know, I don't want to deal with a trust. That's one possibility. We're going to now talk about another possibility. You can alternatively leave assets in what's called a marital trust. A marital trust is a statutory trust, so there are certain requirements that every marital trust has to have in order for it to be uh, tax deductible. We're talking about the benefits of a marital trust for a spouse. Why is this the preferred methodology for distributing assets from one spouse to another? We've got what's called an anti-Barbie trust. We've got what's called an anti-Gigolo trust. These are the same type of trust. It's just a cutesy name for the marital trust so you guys will remember what it means. Let's say the husband passes away and the wife, surviving spouse, goes off with Biff the tennis player or some younger gentleman and you've left those assets outright to your spouse, then when your spouse passes away, she's going to leave those assets outright to uh, the gigolo who's going to run, run away with the assets. And the alternative, and the more common that you know, people joke about, is the anti-Barbie trust, which is if the wife passes away and the husband goes, and I've seen this, I can't tell you how many countless times, I have a number of clients, I even have a client who's 89 years old who just married a 55-year-old, and the child is 60 and there's a big fight. So these things happen, they happen, and I'm telling you, when they do happen, it is a very large stress on the surviving spouse. But when the assets are safe in a marital trust, there's no opportunity to even have that problem or that stress because the assets are protected for the surviving spouse and they can go with Barbie and they can go with their gigolo and they can do whatever they want but when they, and, and they can use those assets for their benefit during their life and when they pass away we're protected, protecting the children. Same situation now happens when both spouses have passed away. So now both spouses have passed away, they ha there are children in the picture. How are we going to distribute the assets to our children? So children's trusts um, are very flexible. There's no statutory requirements about how pay, you have to pay income or you don't have to pay income. But I'm going to give you a couple examples and then I'm going to tell you which one's the preferred methodology, which you'll probably guess. You can do what's called a mandatory income trust. So you pay income out every year. The, the child is entitled to income from the trust every year from a trustee. You can do a trust in which you say, um, I'm going to set certain ages where I think a child has reached maturity and I'm going to distribute out percentages of the trust over time. The most popular, sorry I gave it away, um, way and, the, and really the preferred methodology for leaving the assets to your children is in what's called best interest lifetime trusts. In her speech, Ani Hovanaskian presented the details of asset protection trust for medical professionals, spoke about the importance of choosing the correct fiduciary, and much more. Asset protection for medical professionals. This is a massive topic. There are certain states that allow you to set up what's called a self-settled trust. Self-settled means you have the opportunity to take assets that you own and put them in a trust, and the terms of the trust say that the trust is for your benefit in the discretion of a trustee. This is what's called an irrevocable trust. So in order to have asset protection, it is imperative, and it makes sense when I explain it to you, that you give up control. You have to give those assets to an irrevocable trust such that when a creditor attacks you, you say, I don't have control over these assets. They are in a trust and they are in a trust controlled by an independent trustee of which I have no right to subject my, uh, my uh, will. To balance out the fact that it's completely impersonal and you're hiring a corporate trustee, you have the ability, you appoint what's called a trust protector who is an individual in your family, a trusted advisor like your lawyer, your accountant. Somebody acts 
in a personal capacity who has veto power over the trustee, who can direct distributions, so that you feel like there's oversight over this corporate um, entity. So this is, this is a highly sophisticated strategy. There are many others. I just raise it in the room because um, I'm speaking to medical professionals and it's important for you to understand asset protection. With her substantial knowledge and wide range of wealth planning strategies, Hovhannessian's lecture was both engaging and important from legal aspect of family estate planning. Since Hovhannessian's presentation was relevant to all who were present at the event, many questions from the audience followed. This was one of many events organized by APO to benefit, assist, and educate the Armenian community of New York metropolitan area. Most of us are getting older and we need to learn more about these things and it was a very uh, interesting and educating lecture that Ani Hovhannessian gave us tonight and we had a very uh, educational and uh, pleasurable evening. And I'd like to uh, just say congratulations to Ani Hovhannessian. She did a wonderful presentation tonight and she took some very, very complex material and made it very, very understandable to, a, to the large audience that she had here tonight. It was very well done. Uh, Ani Hovhannessian has developed quite a reputation uh, in estate planning. And uh, tonight has demonstrated uh, a command of this area, which is quite impressive. Uh, I think a lot of take home points here is as healthcare providers, we know, unfortunately, no one is going to live forever and we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our children and grandchildren and families. And with estate planning, uh, it provides us an opportunity uh, to live uh, with the knowledge that there will be minimal conflicts uh, in the future. But we're a very robust organization. We have an event for everybody. Uh, our, uh, most important event coming up is our medical mission. It's going to leave in three, four weeks uh, to the homeland. And we're very excited about this is our fifth medical mission, uh, and it gets better all the time. Uh, the medical mission is not only taking care of individuals, but also involving in training uh, doctors over there as well and transferring medical skills. Uh, and it's a very important part of our telehealth program and our continuing medical education programs. We're doing lots of things, including mentoring our younger colleagues, uh, as well as providing continuing medical education to our colleagues here and in Armenia, to having social events which forced a fellowship.